Hello and welcome back to my RC channel. I'm Andy RC and today I'm doing a shop to flight video for building a race spec 250 size mini quad. It is my intention to build two 250 size quadcopters. This first one is going to be a mid to high range specification using the ZMR250 frame. And the second is going to be a fully top spec build using all premium parts. The reason I'm not going with a super low budget model is because that video already exists. Check out RC Model Review's great video series if you're wanting to go super low budget. The problem I have found going low budget is that you always want to move on from it. You will upgrade the motors, flight controller, battery and eventually there isn't much left of your original spec and you have spent almost double the amount on parts. This first build is going to look at the best bet that you can get while not breaking the bank and also allowing us a few crashes, this being my first 250 build. As this is my first 250 build, I will call this a video log rather than a tutorial, but as I have experience building for 50 quadcopters, I'm hoping that you will find this video useful. So let's get cracking with the shop. Now on these shop to flight builds I get asked a lot, what is the overall price? You can see the individual prices of the items in the shop. I'm not tallying them up myself because honestly I don't want to know. This isn't a low budget build, so if you want to work it out for yourself you can start adding it up now. As mentioned, I'm going to be using the ZMR250 carbon frame. It's probably the most popular frame out there due to its mega cheap price. And for this build, I don't want to be spending a fortune on the frame because I have every intention of pushing it to the limits which will no doubt lead to crashes. There are better frames out there and that will be covered in the second build, but I definitely don't want to be spending $150 on a frame at this point. I have bought the version of the ZMR that comes with a power distribution board. This is a no-brainer to me, it's going to make our wiring so much more simple and it's a very cheap option as well. Next, let's talk about the motors. Now, I have not been in the midi quad scene up to now, but I have certainly paid a lot of attention to it. 250 quads, for the most part, started off with 1806 size motors. These motors have now been retired to the 180 class, and after that, people moved on to the 2204 motors. Now, they are using even bigger motors, but for this video, I am sticking to 2204. A lot of people are still using them, but I guess you could say that it is now last year's spec. For my first 250 quad, it's going to be ample, therefore I'm going to be using the Cobra 2204 2300 kV motors from GetFPV.com. They are not the cheapest of motors by far, but they are not the most expensive either, and they are going to provide an ample amount of power. These motors have a constant amp draw of 16 amps, which brings me neatly onto the ESCs. I'm going to be using the tiny KISS 18 amp ESCs from FlyDuino.net. KISS stands for Keep It Super Simple, and it's what all of the quote pros, unquote, are using, albeit at the moment now the 24 amp ESCs and not the 18 amp ESCs, but the 18 amp is going to be fine for these motors. These ESCs don't come with any wiring loom, so I'm going to be buying a set of these wiring looms. The ESCs also don't have a built-in beck, but that isn't a problem in this build and you will see why later. We are not finished on the Flyduino site yet though, I'm also going to be using the KISS flight controller. You might be surprised that I'm not using a clean flight slash better flight board, but the KISS is a game what the pros have moved to. It appears to be smoother and more simpler than the clean flight offerings, and it comes with lots of presets that you can try without ever having to touch a PID game. It's super cheap as well. You will need some nylon standoffs to mount our flight controller. I like to buy this pack that come in this neat little tub. For the radio gear, I'm going to be using the FreeSky X4RSB. It's pretty much the only receiver that the pros will use due to its low latency. 
A lot of people use the D4R2 on mini quads, but it has a latency of 27 milliseconds. This is the time that it takes for the input on the sticks to reach the receiver. The X4R is digital and only has a delay of 5 milliseconds. I will be using the X4R along with my FreeSky Tyrannis. Be careful as there's two versions of the X4R. Make sure that it is the SB version which stands for S-Buzz. There are many more cheaper options out there when it comes to radio gear. You can check out my Build a Cheap Quadcopter video for that. But honestly, if you plan to progress in the hobby, then you should get yourself a Tyrannus. It will do anything you need, and as I already have one, which I bought for my other aircraft, I don't have to include it in the price of this build, and the same goes for any other build that I do. The battery is a tricky one because it's difficult to get hold of batteries depending on what country you are in. For this mini quad we need a 1300mAh 4S battery with a 50 to 60C discharge rate. You can use up to an 1800mAh battery if you want to get better flight times but with that extra weight you will lose in agility. The pros when they do their racing use a 4S 1300mAh battery. They are using either Thunder Power, Rebel or Luminaire batteries. The only one available to me is the Luminaire 1300 4S battery and also this Banggood make so I'm going to try one of those as well. You can also use the Nanotech 1300mAh battery as well. You will need a Velcro strap to secure the battery in. I'm using two of these Flying Tech straps. They come with a built-in gripper that stops your battery from flying out. You will need two of these to make sure that the battery is fully secured when doing acro. Next, let's talk about the props. Despite what you might think, the pros mostly use three-leaf and four-leaf props. I also have experience with three-leaf props with my Flying 3D X6 quadcopter. I discovered that three-leaf props give extremely smooth flying at the compromise of flight time. The extra blade creates a lot more drag, thus putting more strain on the motors and ESCs, which in turn drains the battery quicker. You will be surprised to hear that our flight times will be about 3 to 4 minutes with this setup, and this is pretty standard for these race spec quads. The motto is live fast and die extremely young in a pile of carbon. As the motors I am using are high in KV, we are limited to 5 inch props. You might hear people talking about flying 6 inch props which are better. This isn't always true and a 6 inch prop with our high KV motors will burn it up. Higher KV will mean better agility. A lower KV motor might give you more power using a 6 inch prop but at the compromise of its agility. A bigger prop takes more effort to turn, therefore it takes more effort to adjust to changes in attitude. You can also think of it like a drag racer. It has ample power and will run the quarter mile as fast as it can, but throw a corner at it or try and make it stop without a parachute and it's useless. The same goes for our setup. The 5 inch prop is a nice middle ground of power and agility. I will be using the Nylon HQ 5040x3 props. Get lots of them as they break so easily. A clip to the ground can take a massive chunk out of them, especially with these high RPM motors. For the FPV gear, I will be using the HS1177 2.1mm Foxia camera from SurveilZone.com. It's only 600 TV lines, but the less TV lines, the less latency you will get, which is why with these mini quads we don't want to go much higher than 600 TV line. I'm getting the NTSC version. You will want the IR block. Top or bottom connector doesn't really matter. I'm getting the one with the bottom connector as I am reaching out to my friend Lee at Painless360 for the camera mount. The HS1177 comes with its own mount, but I find it a bit awkward to screw in. The ZMR250 frame comes with a camera plate, but it is non-adjustable. 
On Thingiverse, you can download a 3D printed bracket to fit the HS1177 camera and the ZMR250 frame without any modification. My thanks again to Lee for printing this off for me. You can find a 3D printing service on the net if you wish to go via this route, or use the standard mount that comes with the HS1177, but you might have to drill some holes in it. For the on-screen display, I'm going to be using the TBS Core, also known as the PMP50. For a mini quad, we only need the battery voltage and potentially the current. The PMP50 does this job perfect without any messing around. It isn't cheap, but it works. We are going to need to modify it slightly for mini quad use. It comes with 16 gauge wire, some of them come with 14 gauge wire, but 16 gauge wire is too thin for a 4S battery, so I have got some extra 14 gauge silicon based wire to replace it with, as well as some spare XT60 connectors. For the VTX, it doesn't really matter what we do. The pros will be using the Immersion RC 600 milliwatt VTX. Those are really expensive and overkill for what we need, but to stick to what the pros are doing, I will be getting one. 200 milliwatts is plenty enough though, and there are much cheaper options available on Banggood, so definitely check that out. Antennas, again the pros will be using the Immersion RC Spironet antennas as they are most likely sponsored by them. You don't need them though and can use cheaper ones from Banggood. Again I'm going to try the Immersion RC antenna and see if the hype is justified. For the video receiver, I will be using my Fatshark Dominator V2 goggles. For these mini quads, goggles are not essential, but in my experience, trying to fly proximity with a monitor can be tricky, especially in changing light conditions where the sun may be shining on the monitor. It's also easy to get distracted with what's going on around you if you use a monitor, so if you don't want to go down the fat shot route, you have the Quantum option or the View XL or the Head Plays. You know my opinion on fat sharks that they are overpriced and not great quality, but I have them, they are compact, and it's what the racing guys use, so I will be using those. I have done reviews on the Dominator V2s and the HD2s if you want to check them out on the channel. Next, a mid-range mini quad wouldn't be complete without a HD camera to show off the fruits of your skills or lack of skills in my case. The budget option would be the Mobius, however we really want the camera to do 60 frames per second. Fly mini quads is all about fast and fluid motion, we can't show that with a Mobius as it's limited to 30 frames per second. Our options are the Runcam HD, the Foxia Legend, the Xiaomi Yi and the GoPro Hero 4 Silver or Black. My favourite budget cam is the Xiaomi Yi, so I will be using that, but I also have those other cameras to try. You also need an SD card that's up to scratch as well. I use the 64GB XC series for the Xiaomi Yi. Now we can start to get into the nitty gritty parts. As we fly these mini quads mostly in fast forward flight, we want to find a way to angle our HD camera so that we are not always looking at the ground. I'm going to use this flexible 3D printed mount that is made specifically to bolt onto the front of the ZMR250 frame, as well as house our Xiaomi Yi camera. A GoPro also fits into this, but not as snug. You will also need some extra long screws for the Yi mount. I'm using the motor screws from my 450 size quad cup so you can buy spares on eBay. You will also need to buy a Velcro strap for the mount. I'm using these thin straps from picnicquads.com which I also use on my micro bills. This item is also optional, but in the name of tidiness I have bought this 3D printed end plate which allows me to mount an XT60 connector to it as well as a nice place for our FPV antenna. I have bought this 90 degree SMA connector which for the immersion gear needs to be an SMA male to female. I have also bought this 90 degree antenna mount for the receiver, I only plan on using the covers and end caps so I will show you that later in the build. 
To connect our FPV gear to the PMP50, you are going to need 1.25 pitch 4 pin JST connectors. I have these 3 pin JST connectors already. As this setup has no audio, I only need to connect 3 wires, so I'm going to be using those. You will need all the usual tools, such as a soldering iron, 6040 solder, cable ties, screwdrivers, ESC heat shrink and general wire heat shrink, a heat gun or a lighter to heat up that heat shrink, Allen keys, blue thread lock, electrical tape, pliers, cutters, spanners or a socket set. You will need some M3 needle files for the ZMR frame and an M3 drill bit. As mentioned, the frame is very cheap and that comes at a price itself. It's going to need some work on the arms in order to get those 2204 motors to fit. You can't go wrong having a spare LiPo voltage checker as well for that line of sight maiden flight. Anything I have missed I will mention in the build, so unless you have turned off already, let's get and build the thing. So, starting off with the ESC, I have cut a length of electrical tape. I haven't cut it long enough, and the ESC keeps lifting up off the ground, but this is to hold it in place. You can use a solder jig, of course, if you've got one, but I'm using the cheap method of the tape there. So, I'm pre-tinning the already pre-tinned solder pads, but with my own solder, because it heats up at a lower temperature. Some people like to completely remove the pre-tin solder and add their own but I'm just mixing mine in here of course we don't have any wiring looms attached to these ESC's so we're gonna have to add them so this is the side where the motors attach there and the motors are gonna get soldered straight for all of the ESC's and then there's a little solder jumper on there which we can short and that will change the direction of the motors and we'll get into that later. But for this first ESC, I'm just tinning all of the pads. This is where the voltage plus and ground goes in. And this is the wire into the power distribution board to power up the ESC and motors. And then this is the signal and ground solder pad. So just put the soldering iron on the already pre-tinned pad and wait till it heats up and then introduce my own solder. I know my iron is dirty, I know my soldering skills are not the best, so please don't complain about that. If you are watching this video and you are better at me than soldering, you don't need to watch this video. So. I'm using another bit of electrical tape here, and you can see those two solder pads there on the left. Now we're going to short the top one, and this is for one shot, one, two, five. So we need to do that for all of the ESCs, and then the solder pad underneath reverses the direction. This takes some time to do, just put as much solder on there as you can, and eventually it bridges across. So for the motor, I'm going to chop off the wire so that it is shorter. Some people again like to completely disolder these silicon wires, but I'm just going to chop them off because I find that the silicon wires strip much better. And also, as the motors aren't using silicon wires from the start of the wire, they can break off, so I don't want to put too much stress on them. So there you go, I've just stripped those wires there and preparing to tin them. There is a lot of stripping wires and tinning wires but that's how we build a quadcopter. So just tinning these first three wires. As I say the motors are all going to be soldered direct to the ESC in the same order and we will sort out the direction via a solder pad a bit later. There's no software involved for the ESCs, which I like to keep it simple. Okay, so now I'm going to use my electrical tape again, and we've got plenty of solder on there, and I'm just heating it up. You have to be so careful with these ESCs to make sure that you don't catch any of the components. But once one of the wires is soldered in, you can sort of keep it in place with that and get quite a neat soldering job. 
That's it, you want a quick solder, not too much heat. So next, I'm taking the arm, I'm not screwing the motor to it, some people like to do that at this point, but what I'm doing is I'm going to get the power distribution board, and I'm just doing that to measure up my wires because I want to make sure that the signal and ground wire to the flight controller reaches the flight controller, so this is the signal wire here. I just want to make sure that from all angles it can reach the flight controller and I've done that the same with the ground wire as well and now I am pre-tinning this so that it can get soldered to the signal wire, so white is the signal wire now some of these wires need stripping and some of them don't they are the ESC wires that come with that KISS bundle that I bought, the wire bundle, so some of them are already stripped because they're the end of the wire and some of them need stripping. So this is the 14 gauge wire that is going to go from the ESC to the power distribution board. I'm just measuring it up and stripping that and cutting it into length and the same with the ground wire there. One is slightly longer than the other because it's got slightly further to travel so that's why they're not exactly the same size, I measured them up like that. And again, lots of solder here, you want to put loads of solder onto the thicker wires. And the same with the ground there. This does take a lot of time to do. And other ESCs do come with the wires already soldered, which does save time, but I really like these KISS ESCs, and you're going to get such a neat job when we're done. So again, just heating it all up and making sure the solder flows so that we get a good join. Make sure your iron is nice and hot. See here, I just heat the whole thing up. And then the solder on the wire and the solder on the pad just flows through each other. And you get a really nice join. You couldn't break it off with your hand if you tried. So next, I have the 12 millimeter heat shrink. I am cutting it with some cutters, probably best using scissors, but cutters will do. And then you'll be able to feed that through the wires. And I'm going to use a candle lighter to shrink it. It takes some time to do that. So if you've got a heat gun, use a heat gun, but I'm always lazy and I always have a candle lighter around. So it does the job. Make sure that it has shrunk nice and tight, but obviously not too much so that it starts burning. Don't hold the flame in one place at the same time, otherwise it'll burn. And there we go, we have one done. So for that configuration, the motor will spin clockwise. But for two of the other ESCs, I am soldering the one-shot 125 pins together, but also the rotational pins here, and the motor will spin counterclockwise here, even though all of the motors are soldered straight to the ESC. So for two of the ESCs, we are soldering both of these jumpers, so shorting both of them, and for the other two, just the top one, which is for one-shot 125. So next with the frame I'm using a M3 drill bit and that is because the screw holes on the ZMR are M2. So I'm using a drill to widen out the hole and it gets very messy with carbon. And then once you have the hole wide enough to fit in a M3 needle file, you want to file two of the holes slightly longer and that is because on the 2204 Cobra motors two of the holes are closer to the end and two are in the center which is a little bit annoying and it does look messy but once you have gotten the screws on you can't see it at all it looks quite neat so what I do is using the screws that come with the motors and using the washer as I screw one motor in, not using thread lock, and that allows me to line up all the other holes. And then I tighten that up so that it doesn't move. And then I grab my thread lock and a bit of cling film, and then I dab the other screws in that thread lock. Of course, with the washer on, you need the washer so that it doesn't 
move about or the screw head can go through that hole that we have drilled. So I'm going to do that for the three remaining screws. And for the last one, you then unscrew that, that of course doesn't have the thread lock on, that's this one, and then screw that in. I would recommend doing all four screws. I know some people just use two screws, but there's going to be a lot of vibration going on there and a lot of power and torque. So I like to use all of them. So for the ESC that has both of the jumpers soldered, I'm writing counterclockwise on the underneath of the heat shrink. So you're not going to see that. But we want to know which motors are going to spin counterclockwise and which ones clockwise. So we have got two with just the one shot jumper soldered and two with the one shot and the counterclockwise shorted as well. And so we have our four arms. Next onto the frame, specifically the power distribution board and the diatone power distribution board comes with these little washers. And those are to be put on the back end of the screw like I'm doing there and also on the other side. And this is to stop anything conducting. So the power distribution board has electricity flowing through it. We don't want anything to interfere with that. So we have these washers here. So it goes either side of the screw. And I have done that for all of them there and just skipped a little bit because you don't want to watch me screwing all of those in. And you can just hand tighten these first of all. And then what I find is the tension on those washers is enough for you to hold the standoff with your hand and then it tightens up real tight. You don't need to use thread lock here. I've only used thread lock on the motors. Everywhere else should be fine. So these are the standoffs for the flight controller. I'm just gonna take four of these out here. I think it can be any size, but these ones look about right. But the problem is we have these screws here that are too long. So I'm going to have to measure it up and take some cutters and cut them a bit shorter just so that they fit all the way in. So I have my cutters there and cut the end off and then I'm just going to test it quickly. Just screw it in, make sure that it goes in far enough so that we can screw it into the board. Otherwise it'd be too long. So. I'm going to now put the nylon screw underneath and screw these in by hand. Of course we're doing this because you can't get to these screws once the arms are attached. There's another plate that sits underneath there so we need to do all this first. So I have put all those in and screwed them in just by hand and you can't really tighten them up much more than by hand. If you use a screwdriver like I am here just be very careful because you can over tighten them and then the thread becomes useless. So I'm just tightening them up very slightly and just making sure that they don't move. Next, I am breaking off these LEDs. And you also need to decide which end is going to be the front. So I wasn't sure which colors the LEDs were in which order. So the LED that has the yellow background, which is this one, that's going to be your white LED. And I knew I wanted white at the front. Now what you can do is you can take a 12 to 14 volt power supply and stick it on each end of these pads here. And you can see what the colors are. But mine ended up being white at the front, of course. And then I used blue at the back, which was quite nice. Now there is a plate that sits on top of this so you can't really see the lights that bright anyways but it's nice that you've got them. It's good for orientation but nothing else more than that. They aren't that bright. So I'm tinning up these pads on the power distribution board and then just soldering them in here. The plus and minus just making sure they match. It is very fiddly. They move about and they get very hot of course as well so you might want to use some pliers to hold them in place. But once you've got one in place then the other side goes quite nicely so just heat that up with the solder there. 
Okay, next, I am using some masking tape, and the reason for this is we need to put all of the screws through the bottom plate, and then we need to turn it over. And of course, if you do that without using masking tape, all of your screws fall out. And there isn't really an easier way other than using tape to put over the top of it. Of course, you can use electrical tape, salad tape. I just had this wide masking tape with me, which captured both sides of the screws quite easily. So I decided to use that. And of course, masking tape is for masking stuff. And that's all I'm using it for because it's not going to be used on the finished quad, of course. It's just there to hold these screws in place. And the other side, of course, just pressing that down. And here you can see I am looking to see which is the counterclockwise motor. And I've decided that this side is going to be the front. So the counterclockwise motor needs to go on that side and the clockwise motor this side. And the counterclockwise, again, goes diagonally. And the same goes for the clockwise motor. It all gets a bit messy here, so you can see this is why we need the masking tape. Now I'm trying to move the wires out of the way because the power distribution board now is going to slot over the top there. Make sure you get it the right direction in which you chose your LEDs. Again, just moving all the wires out of the way because we want those to fit over the top. And that will just sit flat like that. And then I'm taking more of those washers there and putting them before the bolt that goes onto the arms. And I've done that for all of them at this point. And now I am screwing the bolts onto the top, just hand tightening them for now, just so that I can take that masking tape off. You can see there that the arms are still quite loose, but I can flip it back over. Now I'm using a socket set wrench and putting the Allen key in the other side and tightening them up. This takes some time, so I'm not going to show all of that. Next, I am tinning the solder pads where the ESC wires are going to connect to the power distribution board. That is the thick red and the thick black wire. Just get lots of solder on there. And the same for the plus pad. So you can see there we've got plus and minus next to them. The plus is going to be the red wire. So I'm tinning the red wire with plenty of solder. You want to put a lot on that. Almost to the point where it seems like it's too much. And then use some pliers. I'm actually using cutters here to hold it in place. Sorry that my hand's in the way but that holds it in place so that we can heat everything up and then we're going to get a nice solder join there. We want really nice thick solder joins because there's going to be a lot of stress on this frame. You can see there it just bends round these screws nicely. I'm tinning up the ground wire the same and then I've gotten the pliers this time. Just hold it in place and heat all that solder up and it will just flow onto the pad and you'll get a really nice join. So we need to do that, I'm afraid, for all of these ESCs. There's a lot of soldering involved here, a lot of stripping wires. So just be careful because, you know, we're dealing with a lot of heat here. So soldering those two pads up again and holding it in place while I tin the ground wire here. Loads of solder again. I'm just holding this one in place with my hand here because it's quite convenient, it's at a convenient angle. And I need to strip this wire and tin it and hold it in place and solder it to the plus pad. Same again for the back motors. Tin up the solder pads, tin up the voltage wire. Grab the pliers and hold it in place. Let the solder heat up and it will flow to the pad. And I'm going to strip the ground wire. And tin it and solder it. 
you really want to get these power distribution boards. It's so much simpler. You can see it takes up a lot of time, but it does without a power distribution board, so definitely get one. So onto the last motor, turning the positive and negative pads. and the negative wire holding it in place with pliers again sorry about my hand is in the way and the last one get loads of solder on there and holding it down with the pliers so that we get some nice solder flow And while I'm here, I'm going to tin the battery connector, or should I say where our OSD is going to connect. At this point, I'm going to fit the flight controller to the board, and I am soldering up the boot pin. That needs to be shorted. There's a closer shot there, and that's so that we can load the bootloader software. So now I have shorted the bootloader pins, I can plug the USB into the computer and we should get a solid green light to show that it is in bootloader mode. Usually you will get a blue light. So now we can go onto the computer. Now I have this installed already. This is virtual COM port drivers. You will need to install this to get the driver working. Secondly, we want to go to this website and download the Diffuse program. And lastly, we want to go onto this RC Groups thread and download the RC16 version of the firmware. Now, this will get updated and changed, but at this current date and time, this is the latest. So, it's worth checking out this RC Groups thread for the latest firmware. So, if I now go down to the Diffuse app here, just close that down and if I select choose I can then navigate to the DFU file and press open and then I can now press upgrade your device is re-protected would you like to remove re-protection click yes your device was plugged in DFU mode so it's impossible to make sure this file is correct for this device continue however yes Okay, that is done. So we can quit out of there and unplug this and then I'm going to need to unsolder the bootloader short. Just a dab of the soldering iron on those shorted pins will unshort them. And now if I plug the USB lead into the flight controller, you can see that we get a flashing blue light. Next, I'm going to strip down all of the ground and signal wires those are the ones coming from the ESCs which send the PWM value from the flight controller to the motors. We are going to solder these direct to the KISS flight controller. Some people like to use pins but the flight controller doesn't come with any pins so I am soldering them direct. So just stripping all these wires here that need to be stripped and we're going to need to tin those up. So I'm starting off here with motor one. So the quad is facing towards us at the moment and this bottom right motor is motor one. So this is the solder pad on the flight controller for PWM one or motor one. You can see we have an arrow there on the flight controller that is pointing forwards. So I have tinned up the ground pad and this is the first ground wire from motor one and then secondly the signal wire you will notice they have to be quite long it has to reach the back of the flight controller which isn't ideal I have to say and also not ideal is PWM2 or motor 2 is underneath so I'm having to flip the board over and I am soldering those solder pads just turning them there and then I'm going to tin the signal wire and ground wire from motor 2 
or PWM2, and then solder this directly to the flight controller. So remembering the flight controller is upside down at the moment. I have just done that so that I can solder it easily. So that was the ground wire and this is the signal wire and it runs very close to the other side you can see so careful that you don't bridge those so I'm gonna flip the flight controller back over and secure it in place and then I'm going to attach PWM3 which is now again on top of the flight controller but it's at the back so I'm cutting the wires a bit shorter so that it is neater so that we don't have a lot of wires. See those front wires need to reach around to the back but these back wires are already at the back so I can cut them shorter. It's annoying that they're not all in the right place for the motors that's definitely something that they want to look at. So I'm tinning up motor three for the ground and signal. You can get a diagram on flyduino.net just look for the manual and it shows you which are the pads but the PWM pads those are the motors so this is PWM pad three or motor three slightly different than clean flight I believe and these pads here are quite close together for PWM three so I've tinned those up I'm just flipping the board around that might confuse your orientation a bit. So we're now at the back of the quad and the front of the quad is facing forwards there. So away from us. I am soldering in the ground wire very fiddly because it's very close to the other wire, the other signal wire. But there you go. Just make sure it's not bridged. And then PWM3 signal wire. So... We're at the back of the quad again, and I'm cutting down the wires of motor 4, so PWM4, and I'm just measuring up that it reaches because, again, we need to flip over the flight controller. This one is underneath again. It's really fiddly, but that's what they've done so that everything can fit on the board in it. It's quite a small board. So I'm stripping those wires. I'm tinning them up. And the flight controller doesn't fit on the standoffs at this point because the wires are quite tight, but I've made them just long enough so that they all reach. So I'm tinning here PWM4 or motor 4. Again, the solder pads quite close together. Be very careful not to bridge them. Quite fiddly because there's some components very close to these pads. See, I can't hold it in place, so it's very shaky, but this is the signal wire for motor 4. Just make sure I got a good join there. And the ground wire for motor 4. And after that, that's all of our motors soldered into the flight controller. And then that fits on the top there. At this point, we are going to want to sort out our radio gear. Now, this might not be applicable for the majority of people, but my Tyrannus is the EU version. Banggood sells the X4RSB in the international version only. The international receiver won't bind with the EU Tyrannus. So, if you have an international version of the Tyrannus, you can skip this bit. But for the rest of us, we're going to have to install the EU firmware to the X4RSB. You first need to make sure that you have installed OpenTX version 2.1 on the Tyrannus. I suggest you watch Painless 360's video on how to do that if you haven't already. Then we take the S port cable that comes with the receiver and jab a pin under the servo connector to swap the red and black wires around. You then need to navigate to FreeSky's website and download the X4RSB EU firmware and save it to your computer. Extract the contents of the file and then put your Tyrannus into bootloader mode by holding the trim buttons inwards while turning it on. Then plug in your Tyrannus via the USB into the computer and create a folder called Firmware. 
copy over the FRK file to that folder and unplug the Tyrannis and turn the Tyrannis off. Plug the S port into the X4RSB and then the servo connector into the bottom three pins of the Tyrannis with the red voltage pin at the top. Power on the Tyrannis and long press the menu button. Page over once and navigate down to the firmware folder we created and then press enter. Scroll down to the FRK file, press enter on it and then press flash external device. The LED will flash on the receiver and the Tyrannus will write the new firmware to the receiver. We can now continue on to the build as we are going to cut up that S port wire. So this is the S port cable. So the smart port cable. This is going to allow you to get the voltage telemetry from the flight controller. So I'm just measuring it up there. I've got it plugged into the receiver and the receiver is going to sit underneath the flight controller. And I'm cutting it off because I'm making sure that it reaches these pins here. These are the solder pads for the telemetry. Now you're only going to be able to get the voltage of your battery and that is if you have connected the flight controller's power direct to your battery solder pads because this flight controller has a built-in 5 volt regulator so you can plug in a 4 cell direct into the flight controller and so it's useful to use that telemetry port to tell you your battery voltage if you're not using an OSD it sends it to the Tyrannus but these are the solder pads here for the S bus on the right here so I've tinned those as well so I have cut the S port wire in half and I'm soldering in the signal the voltage and ground what I decide to do and this is completely optional is you can actually use the other side which is a servo head and you can connect that up to your S bus I did this at first but I decided against it and I unsoldered it so I've already tinned that up so just to show you here you can solder that in but these wires are quite flimsy and so I ended up using one of the provided ESC wires that came in that KISS wiring loom kit but I soldered this up. This is an option but it's a bit flimsy there's the ground wire going in but very brittle what I also did at this point was solder in the voltage and ground for the flight control and they've got a couple of options here okay so first of all I'm just gonna solder it to the flight controller so this is the positive wire the red wire and then in goes the ground wire now you can either solder this to the 5 volt regulator on the power distribution board but then of course you won't get the correct voltage telemetry so here is me doing that I'm soldering it to the 5 volt regulator but I unsolder it later because I don't recommend that you're only going to get 5 volts reading all the time through your telemetry if you do that so I've unsoldered that servo lead and I have taken one of the leads from the KISS wiring loom and it is using silicon wire. I also screwed on the standoff screws at this point but I didn't film that unfortunately so you can put those on at this point. So in goes the signal wire and then the voltage wire and then the ground you don't really want that wire coming apart so I thought I'd use the thicker wires there but it is an option to use the other wires and then I'm connecting it to the S bus port here which is the bottom set of pins there on the left now that all the necessary wires are connected we can bind the receiver to the Tyrannus and set up our model mini quads are fairly simple so this shouldn't be too tasking I have created a model called the ZMR250 I have set the model image to TBS Disco. I have set the mode to D16 and our channel range from 1 to 16. I have set the failsafe mode to receiver.
If we page over to the inputs, I have set channel 5 to switch SG for the flight modes and channel 6 to SF for my arming switch. And then done the same for the output mixer. I have also reversed channel 5 in the output screen so that self-level mode is selected as the default mode when the switch is in its high position. Back to the main screen and I'm going to press bind on the Tyrannus, which will cause it to chirp. I'm using a 1 cell 3.7 volt LiPo battery to power the receiver at this point, but if you don't have one you can wait to bind the receiver once the OSD has been installed. We need to hold down the failsafe button on the receiver and we should get some flashing LEDs to say that it is bound. Then I will disconnect the battery from the receiver and when I reconnect it we should get a green LED on the receiver which confirms that it is bound to the Tyrannus. Next we want to set the failsafe so I have set the arm switch on the Tyrannus in the disarm position and the throttle at zero. We then press the failsafe button until the LED flashes on the receiver. And now when the transmitter loses signal, those values will be restored and the motors will stop and the quad will disarm. We will test this later once I have set up the flight controller ensuring that the props are off. Then I'm feeding the antenna of the receiver underneath because it's going to sit there underneath. And at this point, I'm going to plug in the telemetry wire as well to the side. And that receiver is going to fit nicely underneath just the perfect size. And make sure that our wires are all neat. It's quite a neat job. So the PMP50, also known as the TBS core, I'm going to modify it slightly. I'm going to unscrew this casing, and we're going to make it lighter and make it easier to solder to the ZMR frame. So that's going to come apart, going to lose some weight there. And the first thing that we need to do is to short the 12 volt power supply. You can either have 5 volt or 12 volt to your camera and VTX, but of course I'm using 12 volt VTX and 12 volt camera so I'm shorting both of these two pins for 12 volts and I'll zoom in on that in a minute so that you can see it properly very fiddly this but it's it's manageable all of this is pretty manageable my soldering skills are not the best and I can just about manage it so there you go you can see it says 12 volt VTX and cam both of the bottom ones shorted Next I'm going to desolder this wire here because I'm going to make a custom wire that's going to fit the ZMR. So I'm just heating it up nicely and then I'm going to give the wire a waggle and then that will come off quite easy. Same with this ground wire and the last voltage wire. So I am taking my own 14 gauge wire, measuring it up against the original wire and then taking some red voltage wire and cutting that up to size too. I'm going to cut four pieces of this in total. So one set is going to go to the power distribution board and the other set is going to go to the XT60 connector, the battery. It means we have less wires to deal with. It's a fiddly job this and I'm stripping the wires and then I'm cutting more lengths of it. I think I actually cut the wires down in the end and restrip them. So I'm adding loads of solder to it. And the same with the ground. And then we solder one of the ground wires to one side of the ground. This is tricky. 
and then the other one on the other side making sure that we don't heat it up too much that the other side comes off but this side securely stays on it's a fiddly job but it can be done and then we are soldering in the voltage line which is the voltage out there you see where it says out on the side and I didn't strip the other wire so I'm stripping that one now and tinning it and this goes to the voltage in there's a current sensor on there and also a voltage sensor which is going to show as an on-screen display to us so it's a bit fiddly but it's worth it next I'm cutting the wires shorter so that it can fit the frame I cut it even shorter than that I think this is just while I get the connector on so I'm now stripping two of the wires for the XT60 and then the other two wires connect to the power distribution board and solder to that so strip both of those Then, using my helping hand grips, which is a pair of pliers and a rubber band, I'm tinning both of those wires in preparation for the XT60. So this is the battery in. And the OSD intercepts that battery and then sends it out on its way to the power distribution board. So I'm cutting two sets of heat shrink here. Just use black heat shrink. This was a mistake I made. The red heat shrink, it gets carbon on it when you use the lighter and it goes dirty. So just use black heat shrink there. But I wanted to color match. It didn't work out. So here I'm taking the XT60. And the bottom wire is the positive voltage. Just adding loads of solder in there to tin it. Make sure that you get a nice pool of solder in there but be quick, we don't want to melt the XT60 connector. Then with my shaky hands, I heat it all up, and we want the whole lot to heat up so that the solder is flowing on both sides so that we get a really nice drawing, and that is not going to come out. Same with the ground wire, I am tinning the XT60 get a big pool of solder going you want to do this all fairly quickly so that's staying hot right there then I am taking the ground wire and while it's still sort of cooling down it reheats up if you are pretty quick you'll get a nice solder join just make sure that all the solder is flowing And there we go, a nice solder join. So I am now taking the heat shrink and using my candle lighter again just to heat it up. As I mentioned though, with the red heat shrink, you get sort of a black carbon mark on it. I, I imagine if you use a heat gun, you wouldn't get that, but I wish I'd used just black heat shrink because I prefer to use a lighter. It's quicker than getting the heat gun out. There we go. So next I'm taking some of the ESC heat shrink that comes with that wiring loom with the KISS bundle and that fits nicely over the PMP50 or TBS core, whatever you want to call it. So I'm then going to use my candle lighter to heat all that up. This takes a while to do to get the heat into it but it's a really nice neat job once it's done. You then need to cut out the connectors, so I use some cutters there, just cut some holes out so we can put our connectors in from our camera and VTX. See that wire dangling there on the other side? That's going to connect to the power distribution board. So 
I'm using two three pin JSTYs. You can use four pin as well, but I like to use three here because I'm only using three wires. So I've stripped those and tinned them, but these particular ones are are colored in the wrong order and it doesn't really matter but I like to have red for voltage, black for ground and yellow for video so I'm using a pin to undo the little connector there and I'm placing them in the right order and need to do that for both sides of the connectors because I'm basically making a pigtail connector here I suppose you could buy a pigtail connector already made but I find it easier to make my own so I'm going to do that with the other side. There you go, in the same order. And then we're going to join these two together. So I'm going to tim one side. And then take the other connector, but I'm going to put a heat shrink down is a smaller heat shrink for these ones. Then I'm going to place that in the helping grips and I'm going to solder those wires to the other wires which will give us a pigtail connector. One will connect to the camera and the other side will connect to the PMP50 TBS core. So yellow wire to yellow. Red to red. And black to black. And then of course we're going to move up those heat shrinks and get the lighter on them again. We have the pigtail connector complete. So this end's going to go into the camera here, and you can see red will go into the voltage, black into the ground, and video will be the yellow wire, and it fits in nice and snug there. I've also connected that 3D printed mount for the camera and screwed the camera in as well. Then the other side will fit into the PMP50, and that will power the camera as well as send the video. Next I'm going to tin the voltage and ground wire that is coming from the PMP50 which goes to the power distribution board of the ZMR frame. You want lots of solder on there. So I'm using my pliers to hold the wire down. See we've got the big plus there. That's where the red wire goes. Just heat it up and eventually the solder will flow and we'll get a really nice join. We definitely don't want this coming apart. And the same again for the ground wire. Next we are onto the VTX and we have a dilemma because the VTX takes its power from a different cable but the PMP50 uses a single cable to have its power out. So I'm taking the wire that came with the camera and I've removed the red voltage wire by putting a pin into the JST connector there and that comes out and then cutting that wire short and I'll be stripping it and then I'm going to solder it to the voltage cable of the power connector for our Immersion 600 VTX. I'm then going to put a heat shrink over the top of that and shrink that down. Now as we already have a common ground with the other wire, our ground wire can just be left. So I can use a bigger heat shrink there and just heat it up and that will stay out of the way. So heat that up and then we have the other wire and I can just take the voltage wire and push it back in to the JST wire and then close the clips so that wire will then go into the VTX slot on the PMP50 and then to the other side of the VTX and then the power connector plugs in there and that is how we power the VTX. 
so I'm unsoldering that 5 volt supply to the flight controller and I'm going to resolder it to the power distribution board connectors so we're going to get the full voltage reading of the battery that we can send to the Tyrannus. Doesn't really matter as I'm using an on-screen display but it's nice to have both of them seeing as that flight controller has an onboard regulator so so that I don't desolder the bigger wires I'm just soldering on the top of the wires and that isn't a problem it fits nice so we have this 3d printed mount which is going to house my antenna and also the VTX so the SMA connector just fits through there and then we use this 90 degree connector and then that screws on to the SMA connector which secures the VTX to that plate as well which is nice just using some pliers to tighten that up and then the XT60 tension fits in underneath like that it's really convenient and then the whole thing slots onto the back two standoffs and we have a really nice neat solution for our VTX and also our XT60 connector so I'm gonna plug the VTX back in there make sure that you route the wires underneath the PMP50 to eradicate any noise then I am taking some heat shrink tubing and this is going to house our antenna. Now I'm going to take one of the little straws that came with that antenna kit and that is going to fit over the top of one of the antennas but I'm not using anything else in the kit other than the end so I'm going to slot the heat shrink over the top there and that's going to sit on one of the standoffs and then we have the tip there that just tension fits over the top just makes a nice neat job so that looks like this but then what we can do is using that candle lighter is I can heat up the heat shrink which tightens it all up but it also melts those straws to the point where you can actually bend them to about 90 degrees because we want them to sit at 90 degrees don't heat them up too much but when they cool down they stay in place and we have a nice neat solution so now I'm fitting the top plate we're using four of these screws that were provided in the original kit but at the front I'm going to be using the Xiaomi Yi slash GoPro 4 mount which is going to require longer screws because they're not very long these screws into the standoffs so I'm going to screw those in make sure they're nice and tight we're not going to use thread lock for these you also want to make sure that that camera mount is slotted in at the front there are two holes and it just slots in nicely and then the lid fits on the top of that and you can see here I'm using the longer motor mount screws that I used on my 450 build they need to be longer because they need to go through this mount and reach the other side we're getting close to the end now I'm screwing in the antenna and then this is the strap from pitnickquads.com which is going to hold the camera in place nicely you can just lift the rubber up, it's kinda of like a rubber material even though it's 3D printed, it's flexible so the camera will fit on the top there, this is the 20 degree angle and then the strap just goes around the top there Now I'm fitting my battery straps and putting two on. These are great battery straps. You can see there that they have a grip on one side so the battery doesn't move. It's good to have two of them so that the battery doesn't fly out when doing acro. So that's both of those in place.
Now I'm using cable ties to cable in the ESCs so they don't move because ESCs vibrate a lot. And what I like about cable ties is that if we have a crash, cable ties will snap. Some people like to use heat shrink over the arms. I prefer cable ties because it means our ESC can ping off if the arm breaks. And they're easily replaceable. You can't do that with heat shrink to take the arms off. Now that everything is connected and installed, we can plug the battery into the quad and navigate to the telemetry screen on the Tyrannis, which is currently on page 12 in the menu. If I press discover new sensors, we will get a list. With the 18 amp ESCs, we will only be able to see the battery voltage. If you use the new KISS 24 amp ESCs and connect the telemetry wires to the flight controller then the other sensors will populate, but that's for another video. This is a nice backup feature but I will be using the voltage seen on the TBS Core on screen display. You might be thinking by this point that there is nothing super simple about the KISS flight controller and you would be right, that is until we get to the software. You download the KISS GUI as a Chrome app the same as you would Clean Flight. Plug the flight controller's USB into the computer and select the COM port at the top and press connect. We only have two screens to deal with. The settings that we need to change are minimal. UAV type is Quad X as standard which is what we want for a mini quad. Receiver I want to have set as FR Sky S Bus. Minimum throttle I have set to 1080, max throttle is set to 2000, min command is set to 1085, mid command is set to 1500, and try your mid is set to 1500. Something to take note of is that if you have the min throttle set to 1080, then the PIG controller will not be active at idle throttle. In other words, at idle, any stick movement to the pitch, roll or your axis will not have an effect on the quad. If you set the min throttle to 1000, then the PIG controller will be active at idle throttle and air mode will also be active. I have chosen not to do this with the initial flight and kept the min throttle at 1080. I also found that when testing the failsafe with the props on, it can have adverse effects having the pig controller effective at zero throttle. When I spooled the motors up and turned the TX off, the quad instantly flipped on the ground and broke all of the props. We need to select one shot 125 as per the solder jumper that I did on the ESCs. The preset PID I have selected as the ZMR 250 which is also the default PID setting. You can select user presets here if you wish but for this build the ZMR preset works perfect with no adjustment required. RC rate is your dual rates so the amount of general throw that you have on the sticks. RC curve is exponential which allows you to have a lower rate close to the center of the sticks and a more extreme rate the further out from the center you go. Rate relaxes the PID controller as you move your stick away from the center which allows for smooth flying towards the center of the sticks and fast accurate flips towards the edge of your sticks. For the AUX channel setting, I have Auxiliary 1 set to Level Mode, which is my 3 position SG switch, and then the ARM set to Auxiliary 2, which is the 2 position SF switch. You only really have two useful modes with the KISS flight controller. Unlike Clean Flight, there is no Horizon mode, which I personally find a nice feature to get you into Acro, but these days I never use it so I can see why they have left it out to encourage us to use Acro mode and learn it. I like to use level mode for landings and takeoffs just to help me to deal with the extreme angle on the camera. It helps me to get an idea of where level is. LPF stands for low pass filter. Flight controllers don't like unwanted noise coming from the battery, ESCs and FPV gear. An onboard low pass filter irons out any issues you might be having there so you can play around with that. I have got mine set to high and it works fine. 
Once you are done there, you can save the settings. You can also share your preset if you have made any significant PID changes. Onto the data output tab and you can view your PWM inputs to check the direction of the sticks is correct. You also want to put the quad on a level surface and calibrate the accelerometer here. Next we want to calibrate the ESCs. This is where the KISS FC is lacking in functionality somewhat. On most flight controllers to calibrate the ESCs, all you have to do is plug the quad in and turn the transmitter on with the throttle in the high position. When the KISS FC boots up, it is disarmed and therefore it does not send its throttle PWM value to the ESCs. So as a workaround, you have to plug the quadcopter into the computer first via the USB cable. Set the MIM PWM value to 2000, which is recognized as the maximum throttle and then save the settings. You then need to arm the board using the arming switch. Then plug in the flight battery which sends a 100% PWM value to the ESCs and the ESCs then recognize that they are in calibration mode. Hit the disarm switch on the Tyrannus which tells the ESCs that we are at the minimum throttle. The ESCs are then calibrated. You then need to set your minimum throttle back to 1080 or whatever preference you had and save the settings again. It's not super simple, I think you will agree. Before putting the props on, you'll want to plug in your flight battery and arm the quad to ensure that everything is okay. If you have followed this video, then all of your motors will spin in the right direction. If your motors are spinning before the quad is armed, then the ESC calibration did not work correctly and you will need to repeat the process. At this point, you will want to check that the failsafe is working by turning the transmitter off while the motors are running and they should stop. So lastly is the props. I'm using the three leaf props, of course. So you put the prop on, you don't have to put it on heavily, but the props are a really tight fit. So I like to put them on first and hand tighten them and then use a socket wrench to tighten them up after that and that will push the prop right to the bottom of the motor shaft the prop should be touching the bottom but that won't be the case when you hand tighten them like this because it takes a fair bit of force to get those props to sit flush at the bottom of the motor which is good because it means that they're not going to come off as easy So the last one, you can use this video to see the direction of the propellers if you like. This is the correct direction. Then I use my socket to tighten it up. And there we go. Oh, just one last thing. <laughs> I thought I'd put some stickers on it so that if I ever lost it, people would know where to send it to. These were printed off by my friend Rob at microfpv.eu, so thanks to him for those. So everything is actually done. This is everything that I need to go flying. The quadcopter with a full battery which I charged using my B6AC V2 charger. The Fat Shark Dominator V2 goggles with the Next Wave 5.8 GHz module. The Spiranet antenna is attached, and the micro SD card is installed. And of course we have the transmitter. I have also added a strip of black tape to the Yi, as my initial tests produced a lot of noise caused by the airflow over the microphone. You will first want to fly the quad line of sight in level mode to ensure the quad flies properly. My startup procedure is to first turn on the Xiaomi Yi camera. The Yi takes a while to boot up and start recording. Then turn on the Tyrannus, ensuring all the switches are in the correct position and the throttle is at zero. I then plug the battery into the quadcopter. I then turn on the goggles and long press the DVR button until you get a solid red light. And then I short tap the same button to start the DVR recording. Here I am going to explain the on-screen display. Now something that is great about the TBS Core is that it just works out of the box. You don't have to change any settings at all. So in the bottom right hand corner we have got the timer. Now that timer does stay on the screen for a little while but then it turns off. 
Then for every minute in the flight, it then appears. So you can see how many minutes you have been flying for. In the top left hand corner of the screen, that is the battery voltage. So for a 4S, it is not quite fully charged there, but you want to be landing when it reads about 14 volts. Then in the middle, we have the milliamps or amps used. So at the moment, it's not flying, so it's 0.3 amps. And then to the far right of the screen in the corner where it says 3 milliamps, that is our overall amp draw. And that is it. It is pretty simple. Let's go and take it for a flight. I like to take off in level mode and then I very quickly switch to acro mode. Now you will have to pardon my flying, I'm still very new to flying this 250 so my rolls will be a little bit inaccurate and I imagine that this video will seem pretty tame in comparison to the professional guys who do the racing and the freestyle but I'm happy with my progress and I really wanted to get this video out without crashing it so I haven't had a major crash with this yet but uh, really happy with the way that it flies it is just so locked in even with me being inexperienced in flying an acro these rolls are just so locked in and it just completely just snaps into place after you've done your maneuver. It's such a really nice experience. <laughs> That's me getting the rolls slightly wrong. And this thing is just so fast. I didn't come anywhere near to putting full throttle on. I think the most I've probably done here is about 60% throttle. The thing is just so fast on any throttle that is higher than that and again I wanted to get the video out so definitely look forward to videos of me pushing this a little bit further but I thought I would have some rolls I would go for some back flips and forward flips and see how I do this was a fairly windy day but you wouldn't know it at all this thing just cuts through the air like a knife I'm just doing some punch outs here and you can see that I love that noise when it just snaps into place and I'm getting more used to it you sort of have to guess where the quadcopter is going to stop and you just put full input in that is full input to the edge of the sticks there so I figure I would try some fast forward flight here but it covers so much ground so quickly and already the battery is starting to get low so I'm trying to keep it close in and uh, see how much air I can get when I flip it upside down this is so much fun to fly and I was worried about the flight time only being three to three and a half minutes but honestly after that you have had enough my nerves were going like crazy flying this it definitely gets better the more that you fly but yeah, it uh, definitely gets the adrenaline going and I'm still trying to get used to that. I think as time goes on, it will get easier. I think I do a bit of a fast punch out here and some nice rolls. It rolls so good. And some more punch outs. A double roll there into a turn. And I think I do another big punch out at some point and do some flips and stuff. I think the battery starts to wear down in a minute and I get a bit of a sag. I love that maneuver, but you see there as I get close to the ground, the quad is struggling a little bit more and I punch it out again and I realize that I'm starting to lose the power and so I quickly fly back to myself. So there you go, that is my video on how to build a race spec 250 quad. I hope you enjoyed the video, it has been fun for me to do. So thanks so much for watching, please continue to subscribe, cheers.